Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're going to answer the question of how do you sink a battleship? You know, a lot of our videos, we've talked about uh, what sank X ship or Y ship and how that would affect it. But uh, this is going to be a more generic video on the sorts of things that battleships are vulnerable to and the ways that they've been sunk over time. So, uh, first of all, we're talking primarily about the super dreadnought type fast battleships that were in service during World War II, uh, like Battleship New Jersey. We'll touch briefly on pre-dreadnoughts and older style dreadnoughts and whatnot, but uh, we, we aren't going to go into too much depth with that. And this is more generically, what are they vulnerable to and uh, what are they pretty well defended against? So, battleships have been destroyed in a number of ways. Combat is the main one. We'll talk about that. Uh, there have been a number that have been lost at sea, but into the 1930s, there were some battleships that were lost at sea, like modern dreadnought type battleships. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, scuttling is an option and uh, expending them as targets is another option. And then of course, you've got scrapping when, when their end of life is done or turning them into museum ships as a, as a final form of disposal. So we aren't really going to talk about scrapping or turning a ship into a museum. You can watch some of our other videos for stuff about that. Let's start with scuttling, I suppose. There are a couple of incidences where battleships are scuttled. When Germany invaded France, uh, they allowed the Vichy government that took over uh, to continue to operate their battle fleet. The British therefore bombard the French fleet at Mirz el-Kabir in North Africa, and the remaining uh, French ships retreat back to France. When Germany invades Vichy France, uh, the French do not want their ships to fall over to the Germans, and so they scuttle them in Toulon. So a couple of uh, French battle cruisers and some of the older dreadnought-type battleships are scuttled. Scuttling events would be the Grand Scuttle in 1919. The German high seas fleet is being interred at Scapa Flow by the Royal Navy on behalf of the Allies, while the uh, peace talks are being worked out in Paris. Remember, World War I was only ended by an armistice, so even a year later in 1919, if these talks fall through, the war will resume. Uh, one of the big issues at the talks was who was going to get these German battleships. And the Germans don't really have much say in the matter. Uh, they've been labeled as the bad guys for various reasons. And uh, so it's really the French, the British, and the United States that are uh, dictating the terms. And so the Germans decided to take their toys and go home, so to speak. They scuttled the whole fleet in Scapa Flow. Uh, battleships, battle cruisers, cruisers, and destroyers. Uh, and really, the, the Treaty of Versailles is signed very shortly thereafter. Um, so th this was one of the sticking points. It does allow Germany to start getting aid and food and whatnot again, uh, but it prevents their ships, their national prestige objects, from falling into the hands of the enemies. Uh, and so that's, that's a big reason to scuttle ships. Other battleships, uh, older ones, are scuttled to form uh, artificial harbors in some cases or uh, coastal blockades. So you see ships scuttled in, say, the mouth of a harbor to prevent an enemy fleet from exiting that harbor or entering that harbor. This happens a number of times throughout history, not just with battleships. Uh, during the D-Day invasions, the Allies sunk a number of uh, old dreadnought-type battleships, al along with many other ships and purpose-built structures in order to form a breakwater around the Normandy coast. Uh, they wanted a port that they could load supplies into for the occupation of Europe. But at Dieppe, the Germans proved that they were defending their port cities really, really well. So the Allies decided, if we just invade a regular beach, and then we build like a concrete breakwater around that beach, we've created an artificial harbor. And that'll last for know, a, a year or two, so we can wrap this war up, at least long enough for us to take an actual port from the land side. Uh, and so ships like the uh, 
British dreadnought Centurion are sunk as part of this breakwater. She had no more military value as a frontline target, and so she scuttled. Lost at sea. Um, the most common reason why battleships are lost at sea is they're blown onto rocks. Uh, for example, the Spanish battleship uh, Espana, a dreadnought type battleship, is blown onto the rocks off of the uh, Bay of Biscay in the mid 30s. And the rocks punch a hole in the bottom of the ship, and just like any other ship, she sinks. Uh, this happened to a French battleship. It might have been Paris um, around the same time period in roughly the same place. So there are some places where there are still uncharted shoals and it's dangerous water for battleships and storms can blow up and, and blow these ships onto the shoals. It happens a lot more with pre-dreadnoughts than it does with full dreadnought type battleships, but it does still happen. The ships run aground and sink, but uh, it hasn't really happened to any battleships since before World War II. Uh, in terms of other accidental causes, uh, magazine explosions, like what happened to the Japanese super dreadnought Mutsu. Um, that happened while the ship was in port. So it can happen to relatively modern battleships. Although uh, that was the last non-combat loss. It was far from the first. Uh, so now we, we come to why we're actually here, the, the combat reason ships are sunk. Battleships are designed to be the biggest thing out there, uh, and they're designed to fight other battleships. So battleship on battleship sinkings, you would think, is pretty common. Uh, and it happens. Bismarck sinks Hood, and then herself is sunk. Sharnhorst is sunk by Duke of York. Kurishima is sunk by... Washington and South Dakota. Uh, Fuso and Yamashiro are sunk in Saragawa Strait. It, it happens throughout World War II, and it happens a couple times in World War I, and even more with pre-dreadnought type battleships. But it's not the most common form of sinking. In some instances, battleships are even sunk by gunfire from smaller ships, such as Hiei, the Japanese fast battleship um, that was operating with Kurishima, a little bit before Kurishima is sunk, runs into a force of American cruisers and destroyers and is basically blasted at short range by these smaller gun ships to the point that she's completely disabled and easily finished off by aircraft. Uh, so I've talked about it a couple of times. At certain ranges, your armor just doesn't matter. Even a small gun can punch through your armor if, if they get close enough. Uh, so if not other battleship combat, surely aircraft, that was the new rising power. And we see land-based aircraft, like what sunk Prince of Wales and Repulse, like what sunk Arizona and Oklahoma at Pearl Harbor, uh, what sinks Yamato and Musashi at the end of their careers. Air power is able to sink battleships. But the real thing that sinks most battleships during World War II is punching a hole below the waterline. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, so mines are sometimes used for this. By World War II, there aren't too many mine hits on battleships. Schornhorst and Nisenau hit some. Uh, really, I'm having trouble thinking of too many others in World War II. And Schornhorst and Nisenau both survived their mine hits. But it was much more common with older battleships. Uh, and by the same token, submarine-launched torpedoes are a big threat to battleships. Battleships have no underwater defense. They don't carry sonar, they don't carry depth charges, so they can't retaliate against a submerged vessel. Battleships do carry some gear for mine sweeping, uh, and some battleships even had underwater demolition team type divers who could destroy mines in the water in addition to their mine sweeping gear like paravanes. Uh, but even though battleships have a lot of armor above water, especially earlier battleships had very little protection below water. So World War I era battleships and pre-dreadnoughts for sure, if they are hit below the waterline, uh, tend to sink pretty easily. By World War II, even the ships that didn't have great underwater protection have had blisters added to them. Uh, and 
We talk about torpedo defense in other videos, and we'll probably make a video about blisters at some point in the future. Let us know if you're interested in that in the comment section. Um, but th there are compartments below the waterline that are designed to absorb an impact uh, to prevent a ship from just being sunk outright. And so you don't see huge numbers of World War II era ships catastrophically uh, going down from underwater hits. But it does happen. Like uh, Royal Oak docked in Scapa Flow, takes submarine torpedoes and rolls over and sinks pretty quickly. Uh, same thing happens with Oklahoma. It's aircraft launched torpedoes at Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Italian battleships at Toronto are hit by torpedoes. So it really takes an underwater hit to sink a battleship. During World War I, uh, this happens a fair amount of time with either submarine torpedoes or mines striking even dreadnought type battleships and sinking them. Uh, like HMS Audacious, or the uh, Allied fleet bombarding Gallipoli and the Dardanelles trying to force that straight. Uh, they use a number of pre-dreadnought type battleships, and these ships keep hitting mines and sinking because they don't have any underwater protection. Uh, even by World War II, if you're not hitting a ship underwater, you're not really sinking her. Bismarck suffers a tremendous cannonade and uh, is still not sinking. So she is then torpedoed by a Royal Navy cruiser and potentially the crew opens the sea chests as well. Likewise, Hie is gunned down and does not sink. You really have to engage a ship at long range and get a lucky hit on a magazine like what happened to Hood or bring something that's gonna damage them below the waterline. Very rarely do you have gunnery related sinkings like Karishima, where uh, one ship is shelled to the point that it sinks. If you can open enough holes below the waterline, you can sink the most heavily armored ship. And it was calculated that Iowa class battleships could take six torpedo hits on a side below the waterline before their reserve of buoyancy would be lost or their torpedo defense would be defeated and the habitable interior part of the ship gets flooded. Uh, and the Iowas are some of the largest and most powerful. So for most battleships, it would be a little bit less than that, but uh, still more than one or two in most cases. One way that we haven't really mentioned, but sort of fits into the below the water thing is sabotage. A couple of British dreadnought type battleships during World War II were sunk by uh, basically underwater frogmen conducting sabotage while they were in the port of Alexandria. Um, torpedo boats were also used, most famously against Svent, uh, Svent Istvan uh, during World War I. So again, you're using different methods, whether it's aircraft or mines or submarines or humans, but you're planting explosive charges beneath the waterline to sink most of these ships. What do you think is the most interesting way a battleship's ever been sunk? Let us know in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of businesses and private individuals like yourselves. In particular, your donations over the last 18 months have allowed us to make more videos, uh, and we appreciate that. There's a link in the description if you'd like to continue to support us. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Let's other people know that we're making content and it'll let you know that we're making content. You'll get notified when we put out new videos five times a week. Thanks for watching.